Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have two special guests with us today. Meg, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, good morning to you. My name's Meg. Um, I work with the Salvation Army International Development Team, or we refer to it as SED. Um, I've worked with a variety of different development actors over the last uh, decade or so, um, some faith-based and some not. But it's been an absolute delight to be working with Salvation Army International Development Team uh, from the beginning of this year. Um, yeah. And Stephen, can tell us who you are? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Howes. I'm uh, at the Australian National University. I'm a professor in economics. I also direct the Development Policy Centre. Uh, so we undertake research and analysis in relation to international aid and development. Uh, with a special focus on uh, the Pacific and, and PNG region. Excellent. Uh, just before we go, I just want to sort of acknowledge the lands on which we meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. So to kind of set the scene about international development, uh, Meg, can you kind of give us an idea of the projects that you have, the kind of experiences that you have working in international development? Yeah, sure. So... So the role really of the Salvation Army International Development Team, which I'll just refer to as said going forward, uh, we have so many acronyms in the Salvation Army, so I'll try to make sure I explain those before I use them. Um, but our role is as a um, support territory is to support the international development projects uh, in our implementing territories. So that looks like um, having strategic areas um, that we've committed to in our strategic action plan. Uh, those thematic areas are health, uh, livelihoods, and reducing vulnerabilities. Uh, but the projects themselves um, vary from WASH projects, um, conservation agriculture projects. Um, um, I've got a trade school that we're working with uh, in Rwanda. Um, but our, our role here in our team is to really support those that are doing the projects. So I'll clarify, I'm not actually the one that should be getting any acknowledgement for the amazing work, our partners, uh, just um, such amazing uh, development professionals um, and community members. Um, so it's our joy and privilege to support them. Um, SED supports um, over nine different countries. So we work with our partners over a long, long, long period of time um, so that we can strengthen the uh, capacity of those development offices. Um, so I have the privilege of working with our partners in Rwanda, Malawi and Kenya. Um, and I'm, I'm over about uh, 10 or 11 projects at the moment. So with the projects, what surprised you when you sort of, you said you've got involved recently and you've also been involved in sort of other with the other development organisations, what's the kind of big surprise that so the public wouldn't know or, you know, oh, I didn't know we did this sort of thing or this is much more difficult than I thought? Or... Yeah, sure. Um, it, it is, um, I think, a bit of a hidden gem. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the greater Australian public are aware of this is something that Salvation Army is um, partaking in, but certainly not to the level um, that they are as well. So a lot of big international NGOs um, maybe dabble in a little bit, you know, a quite a wider field. And sometimes that can raise the flag of, oh, is this, is this being done well or is this just another area to work in? Um, but the, the wonderful thing I will say about the Salvation Army International Development Team is that they are, it is to a high capacity and it is always with the attitude of improving and learning um, and so... I've been really, really impressed since working with them, um, the level to which they're doing it, the standard, um, but then also the attitude that they have. And I think that's, um, yeah, one of the things that surprised me and delighted me was the attitude we have with our partners. Um, it, it's, it's certainly trying to be aware of, of empowering them that this is their, this is their work, this is their change, and we want to make it sustainable. Um, this is not something we want to be... Um, having any type of global north, global south relationship, any, any propping up any unhealthy power dynamics within the eight world. So um, I've been really, um, really impressed by the way that they go about um, international development. 
Are there common themes amongst all the projects? Do you hear the kind of the same thing from all the partners, like main issues or feedback? Sure, no, I mean, no, the communities, um, every need is so different between each community. Every need is so different between each individual. So uh, the projects face um, different challenges um, and, and certainly um, the world is changing so quickly. We have increased natural disasters. We have increased vulnerability uh, with the environment. Um, and so those challenges present differently as well, depending on the context. Um, um, yeah, it, it's fantastic jumping into a Zoom call with a partner and orienting myself on, okay, what's what's been going on the last month with the project activities? What are those challenges? Um, and 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 how how is the project staff responding to those? How can we support you and make sure that we're actually um, working with you, not not advising on what we think would be a solution here? Because oh, I've I've worked in Wash before. Or, oh, I've, I've I've been in this space before. But working with them to recognise contextually what would be strengthening their projects because I, I'm an expat. I have no, uh, no, no on the ground experience of what it looks like that day in the projects. So, um, and what yeah. are some of the projects that you've <laughs> looked at recently in your work? Sure. Um, so I was just recently on a call with um, our partner in Malawi, uh, and they are in the last phase of a very, very big wash project uh, in the Kurunga district, um, which was responding, uh, responding to a variety of challenges. Um, and inevitably, when you're working in community, um, things change over such a long, a long project. So this is a five year project. Um, and so our partner Matthews was able to um, meet a need that came up through, through the identification process. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a very, very quick story just because I think it's, you know, we can talk about projects and processes for a very long time, but it's important to orient ourselves on, you know, on why we're doing it and the people that it, it's impacting. Um, so, so within this, within the area that we're doing the WASH project, it, it became, um, the project staff became aware that there's, there's a specific need within the school, the primary schools, where the wash facilities were just really expended. They were just, there was not, it was not sufficing anymore. Um, the toilets were completely um, just irrelevant for use. Uh, but also for, for the young girls in school, if they cannot go and, um, and take care of their female hygiene needs, they will not go to school that day. Um, so in Australia, we have locker rooms, we have private bathrooms for females, things like that. Um, but this was just certainly not, we barely had toilets. Um, so the project staff were able to pivot slightly and actually do a small construction project in the school, um, build the facilities, but also um, create like a, within the school, we have like a small committee with staff members and students who just take care of the general maintenance. And that looks like making sure that we're washing out the wash facilities. Um, so it's not, okay, we're going to, build this toilet and, it, and we don't care about the maintenance. It's there, we've done our project. Um, no, making sure that this is something that they want, they understand. Uh, and the testimony from a young girl was that, yeah, I can, during my monthly cycle, I can go to school. I don't have to miss five, seven days of school. Uh, and there's privacy and there's safety in that as well. So I when you talk about, testimony. no, it's a great testimony. When you talk about WASH, for those who don't know, so you're talking everything to do with sort of access to clean water, Toilets, sanitation. Yes, I'm sorry, another acronym. Yes, water. Um, Stephen, you'll probably be able to rattle. Uh, that's cheating. Water. That's cheating. Water. Don't help <laughs> us, Stephen. Water, sanitation, and hygiene, I think. Yeah, which looks different in every context. So, yeah, it might look like putting in a. Um, putting in um, a. In someone's in someone's village, you might have a big concrete slab where there's now a borehole, and that's a community wash facility. But it might also look like um, building toilets or training on on why we wash our hands for cholera outbreaks, things like that. So that can look really different too. And when it comes to access to clean water, can you tell us the different ways that looks in 
the countries you work in, because obviously here we think, oh yeah, I go to the TAF, I have it at my home. Yeah, sure. I think something important to remember about um, water is that it's it's really your bread and butter of life. I think here we're so disconnected from that. You know, we just know know it's going to be there. But um, when you have to plan your day and everything around collecting water from um, from a stream or a borehole that's you know really 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 far away, waking up at the early early hours of the morning to go and fetch that um, so that it's cool in the day, it's safe. Um, it impacts on all other parts of life. So when we when we're drilling boreholes and all that comes with that, because that's also a very um, important thing to do well. Um, that's not just impacting her ability or his ability to access clean water. That's also impacting on their time in the day, their family dynamic. Uh, we had a testimony from a community member saying that, oh, my husband's just very happy because I don't have to leave the leave the the home at you know four o'clock in the morning and we have some time together so I thought that that was quite a sweet testimony of of the personal impacts of of creating boreholes that are close by but um access to water impacts everything yeah and you mentioned schools can you give us an idea of what schools are like in some of the places that you're working because here we think oh yeah I go to school it looks like this it has the teachers has all these facilities sure um, so one of the projects that we have the privilege of working with uh, in Rwanda is actually a, a trade school. So that's um, the students coming, they're, they're within the secondary education age bracket, um, but they're coming to learn uh, practical skills that will help them in employment. So really similar to our, our tape or something like that. Uh, and they're in specific areas that, that we identified would um, well, the, the project staff have identified would be employable afterwards. So that's uh, mechanics and then um, we've got a tailoring course as well. So that, that project itself uh, is somewhat of a business so that's sustainable. Um, we're not going to be around um, as a development partner forever. We need to make sure that these projects are sustainable. Uh, but also that's um, giving, giving the young people the skills that they can develop to gain employment. So really practically what, you know, what will actually be employable in your, in your community. Um, and that's, yeah, one of, one of the projects that I'm, I'm always excited to hear about. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real delight to hear about the students and how well they're doing. And can you tell us about some of the other projects you've worked on recently, whether it's to do with sort of food or more with sanitation or education? Sure. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, there was a, a very large cyclone um, that hit a variety, a few countries and then impacted on, on flooding from then, Cyclone Freddy. Uh, and that had a huge impact on the communities that we work in in Malawi, um, just destroying crops, houses. Um, when you live off what you grow, um, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, and so our project was not working in the emergency response um, and we... We had some elements within the project that were conservation agriculture, um, but the project staff again were able to pivot uh, and we did a small um, NFI distribution or non-food item distribution uh, and also um, doing the, the food packages as well of, of grain. So um, that was greatly received, a drop in the ocean, um, but I think it's important um, when thinking about projects of, okay, the context will change. Um, people's need will change. Um, you know, one day it was okay. How are we going to work with farmers to 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 increase yield and and and, and think about um, think about sustainability within farming? To okay, now we just we just don't have that, uh, and we need to make sure that people people are fed. Um, and, and within that context as well, I think it's important to remember the lane that you're in and your capacity in that. So um, one of the things that I love about our projects is that there's always partnerships with the, whoever else is in that field as well. So um, we're not going to solve everything. Uh, we're not going to be the answer to every problem, um, but can we identify who we can work with that is, is going to be able to make change in that space? And the context that you work, can you give us an idea of that? Because I think sometimes people have the idea, oh, okay, you're like you're at a refugee camp, are you? Or you're, you know, there's a huge group of people around you and you're, you're giving them bags of grain, but you're working obviously across all sorts of areas, not, you know, in, in, in neighbourhoods, in schools, in 
farm areas, etc. Sure. Yeah. So, so the Salvation Army International Development Team, we're we're not um, we're not in emergency response um, space. So um, we are working long and slow in community development. Um, so that looks like um, the the target communities that that we already have connections in. We have um, Salvation Army um, territories all around the world. Um, and those will, maybe it's a church uh, or it has, they're already doing other projects, um, not, in, not in, de in the development space, but they're um, it's a youth group or it's, a, or it's um, a women's group or something like that. So we're working with our partners in the ground that they already have connections in that community. Um, and, and that just looks so different depending on, depending on where we are, whether that's Papua New Guinea or, or Kenya or, um, or Indonesia. So it just, yeah, very different in each context. And everything is, as, as you said, different. Can you, and this is a, a tough question because it is different. Can you give us an idea of the, of the day in the life of some of your uh, workers or partners, like what it actually looks like, say, if you were with them for a day, what are you going to see? What are you going to experience? What are you going to have to kind of navigate that we might not even think about? Like we have some people here who go up to PNG and say, look, it's very different. You know, obviously safety point of view, what you have to have with you. Yeah, sure. Um, it really depends on what the project activities are doing at that time. So and that's an important thing to remember. There's this misconception that you're always, um, you're always doing the work that you're, you know that the stereotypical idea is like, oh yeah, we're, we're, it's it's fun and it's exciting or it's it's always in the field and it, it is. Um, but a lot of the time, our project staff are waking up very very early, coming to um, to to the decentralised offices and um, jumping on a bicycle and going visiting community and doing some monitoring and evaluation. Or it's or it's actually we spent we spent a couple of weeks in the, in our in our small development office doing reporting because. Um, that's just the context of what this work is. Um, it's not always um, activity, activity, activity. So um, monitoring and evaluation are, are a huge part of um, what, yeah, what the day-to-day -day looks like for the staff. Um, but really, it's it's it it just depends on what activities they're doing. You know, when someone's been in the community because they jump on the call and they're so excited and beaming, um, and I think um, you know that that is a beautiful part of of what they get to do. And areas of focus, do you have a specific area or, or a certain number of uh, areas of focus, whether it's to do with sort of gender equality, education or, or some other area? Yeah, sure. So um, SED covers three thematic areas, um, health. Um, so that's sustainable um, goals one, two, three and six. Uh, and then livelihoods, um, so four, eight and ten. And then reducing vulnerability. So we are working. Um, a few of our projects are, are what we call child rights projects, um, and those we have specialists um, that will be over those projects as well. So that's four, five, and sixteen um, sustainable development goal. Um, we've we've kind of tried to funnel what areas we're working in. Again, it's important to identify what lane you want to be in, um, so that you're not spread thin and you're not serving. Um, your partners or well, and uh, also your project staff well. So those are the areas that we've identified that we have the expertise uh, to, to invest in. Mm -hmm. And what are some of your health programs? Like you mentioned sort of with water, what are some of the other sort of health projects you have? Sure. Um, so it really, often, often we'll have the core of what that project is looking at, whether it's um, yeah, whether it's boreholes, constructing um, toilets um, for a healthcare clinic that's nearby, um, and then and then it'll kind of branch off from that. So um, one of the projects we're actually just in the implementation phase of in Malawi, we'll actually be looking at um, about training um, for teachers and healthcare workers on reproductive health. Um, from the lens that we would like to bring, yeah, so talking about uh, reproductive health, but really because we want there to be more of an understanding of um, early child marriage as a major problem within Malawi. So 
you know, here, here are some tools, here's the training, but it's because we're trying to combat um, uh, early teen pregnancy and early marriage as a solution um, because this is, this is taking girls out of school. I mean, you can just research it. It's one of the biggest problems in Malawi. So um, uh, that's one of the areas that excites me. I think it's, it's certainly a passion within the project staff because they can see that being, um, being an area to make change in. It's, it's such a big thing um, to tackle from a health perspective. Um, but again, it just has a huge ripple effect um, on, on, on all other areas um, of those girls' lives. Yeah. Excellent. And, and, can young you, men. Yeah. and can you tell us a little bit about the Salvation Army itself? Because obviously most people are like, yes, we know you do the music. Can you tell us a bit more <laughs> about the actual Salvation Army? Sure. So the Salvation Army is a, a large international um, non-government organisation. Um, our IHQ is in London, um, but we are uh, doing a variety of things. Our territory here in Australia um, is based out of Sydney, uh, and you'll know us for, from um, from the the projects, whether it's um, our missions projects or whether it's our, our business partners, um, or probably some of these more obscure departments, like I said. Um, but the, the heart of the Salvation Army really is that um, the overall goal is to increase the communities that are moving towards uh, alleviation of poverty. So uh, our focus here at Zed is to work alongside communities. Um, and I think you can see that, that attitude and that posture in, in the work that the Salvation Army does, whether that's down at a core office and you'll, you'll see an officer um, working with a local community member uh, in, in securing safe um, public housing, or whether that's um, whether that's supporting other community projects that are that are going on uh, as well. So I have I have real respect for the um, the way that Salvationists live their lives. They're so they're so dedicated and and um, and really really want to make want to make sustainable change. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Stephen, if I can bring you into this, can you give us an idea of sort of foreign aid in a, from, from an Australian perspective? Uh, sure. Well, I guess um, you know, it was very interesting to listen to what Meg was saying. And I guess she was sort of focusing at the micro level of one particular organisation, set of partners, set of projects. And uh, I can shed a bit of light on sort of what's happening at the macro level. Um, I mean, starting with Meg's, area you know we call another NGO I'm sorry another acronym you know we use is NGO or international NGO that's how we describe Salvation Army or at least their international development work of course there's some agencies like Salvation Army that do work both in Australia and overseas others you know like you might have heard of World Vision Oxfam uh, predominantly uh, do do work overseas and uh, of course they raise money from the Australian public uh, and that's a pretty significant uh, amount of funding, actually. It's about a billion dollars every year. So that's just from the Australian public. Uh, but then bigger than that is the Australian government aid. Um, and, you know, that's because, uh, you know, they, they obviously the Australian government uh, gets its funding through taxes. You know, unlike donations, you don't have much of a choice as to whether you pay taxes. Uh, so the Australian government's obviously a huge organization and so therefore they're able to support a very big aid program. Uh, and the size of the aid program now is about uh, four and a half billion Australian dollars. Uh, that sounds like a lot of money, but it's a small amount of money in relation to total uh, government spending. Uh, it's, it's much less than 1% actually, or significantly less than 1% of, uh, of total government spending. So it's, it's a large amount of money in absolute terms, uh, but it's not a, a major uh, use of, of government funds. And in terms of uh, how that money is used, in, um, in how that foreign aid money is used, uh, it's really hard to summarise, I'll just say that. Um, some of it actually does go to support NGOs uh, like Salvation Army. The government has a sort of matching program so that the more money 
these NGOs raise from the public, uh, the government sort of matches that and uh, so increases the, the scope of the, of the NGOs to do good work overseas. Um, but that's only one use and in fact, not the main use. Uh, there's also a lot of money. In fact, the biggest single use uh, of the Australian aid is actually transfers to other aid organizations, what we call multilateral organizations uh, or, or inter intergovernmental organizations. So this is like the United Nations, the various UN agencies, uh, this is the, the multilateral banks, like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. So Australia is a big supporter of these organizations, and we channel money to them to, uh, to implement uh, aid projects. Uh, and then we also have uh, 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 for-profit or, or private contractors, uh, companies that bid for aid projects and, and implement them. Uh, and then some other government departments, universities, uh, there's a whole range of actors uh, involved in a whole range of countries. Uh, Meg, you know, was talking about Africa. Most of our aid, Australia's government aid, actually goes to uh, more in our geographic region, uh, to Asia and especially now the Pacific. Um, and then in a whole range of sectors, uh, sort of everything from uh, humanitarian aid responding to disasters through to the sort of uh, health and water supply uh, you've been talking about. Uh, right through to sort of more abstract uh, projects uh, in the area of uh, trying to improve government uh, functioning. So uh, it's a fascinating area. It's an important area. It's one that's it's difficult to summarize. In, indeed. I, I, I've, I've given it a go. We do as a centre, we have something called the Aid Tracker. So if you just look up on your search engine, Australian Aid Tracker, you'll find a lot more uh, information if, if this is something you're interested in. When, when it comes to sort of effectiveness of aid, is there a need to improve it? And if so, how can we improve it? Yeah, sure. That's a big question. I guess there are really two uh, dimensions that are important. I guess quantity and quality. So, you know, if aid on average is, is good, then the more of it we have, uh, the, the more, the better a job it will do. And, um, you know, that's certainly, I, I, I mentioned that first because it's become such a big issue. Um, you know, I think most people may not realize that uh, our aid, we become much less generous as a nation uh, when we look at our, our foreign aid budget. Um, you know, there's a, what we call the generosity index, uh, which is your aid, your government aid, divided by the size of your economy, uh, GNI. Because obviously, we, you know, much bigger countries, you'd expect them to give more aid. So we use this, this is internationally used as a, a metric for comparing uh, aid across countries, comparing generosity. And, you know, through the, like last, through the 90s and 2000s, Australia, we were more or less a generous, uh, sorry, we were more or less an average donor. So we weren't really the leader uh, of the pack, but we were, we were in the middle of the pack. Um, but over the last decade, uh, with the aid cuts we've seen, uh, we've really gone down to the bottom. Of, of that index, you know, there are the out of the OECD countries, the little Western countries that um, you know all give aid. Uh, you know, there are about thirty of them, and our ranking is now, I think, it's twenty seventh. So we've gone to the bottom of the pack, and I think that's something that reduces our aid effectiveness, and also should just give us pause for thought. You know, is this the sort of nation uh, we want to be, uh, such an ungenerous nation? So that's the quantity side. Then there's the quality side. You know, are you giving that, using your aid money well, or are you uh, wasting it? I mean, that's a very complex question. I think there's no simple answer to that. Um, I, I'd be happy to talk about it more if you're interested, but perhaps I'll just flag for now those two dimensions, quantity and quality. Thanks for doing that. So going forward, I mean, how do you kind of, navigate that because people will say it's we're not generous enough governments presumably have a response to that and will say well it is good enough or right like yeah. well it's interesting i mean it's really changed over time uh if we think back to the 2000s it was actually under john howard you know under a conservative government that we started increasing aid um and that was carried forward by kevin rudd and there was actually a bipartisan uh, commitment to uh, increase aid, but that really fell apart 
uh, with, the, with the financial crisis, the end of the boom, and then actually when the coalition came to power, they started cutting aid. So their main argument was, uh, look, economic times are tough, the budget's in a difficult position, we just can't afford uh, to give this aid. Uh, now we have a new government uh, with Labor. They've at least committed to stop cutting aid. So they've sort of put a floor under aid. That's a positive, but they've said very little or that they haven't really committed to increasing aid in, in the long term. So I think uh, it, it's, it remains to be seen. I think in general, there's a feeling in the political class that uh, there's not a lot of support out there for aid, that uh, as you know, Australians are doing it tough. Um, you know, right now we've got a lot of inflation, cost of living pressures, uh, housing prices are a problem. Uh, there, there's not a lot of public support uh, for aid. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. But for those of us who believe in aid, uh, you know, it's a matter of campaigning, I think, and, and keep getting the word out that, you know, we, it's, it's a matter of a moral responsibility. I think most Australians don't realize, you know, some of what Meg was talking about, just how different life is in a developing country compared to uh, life in Australia. And you don't have to go to Africa. Africa is probably the poorest continent, but even in, you know, Asia, a country like Indonesia, you know, most households don't have access to what you were talking about. You know, they can't just turn the tap to get water. You know, they, many households don't have access to electricity. So these are poor countries. Most of them, you know, live below our, our own poverty line. Uh, so yeah, we have a, a huge responsibility, and we and we need to keep campaigning for more aid. And you know, we have aid is not going away. I'd also give that message. You know, there are so many uh, global challenges um, that are only intensifying, uh, and that we can only respond to through aid, whether it's uh, COVID nineteen. Or, or climate change. So AIDS not going away, and uh, those of us who believe in it need to keep, keep campaigning uh, for more and better aid. And can you tell us a little bit about PNG? Because I know we give them uh, a certain amount of aid. Can you just give an overview of, sort of what happens there in relation to um, aid? Sure. Yeah, well, PNG has actually um, become the most uh, important, uh, the biggest uh, recipient uh, of Australian aid. And uh, it gets about uh, 500 million, uh, uh, 600 million now, 600 million dollars a year of aid. Um, and you know that's, I guess, it's not surprising that it's uh, it's the biggest recipient because uh, it is our former colony. It's uh, it's so close to Australia. I mean, it's only uh, about four kilometres actually that separate uh, PNG and Australia. And um, it's a poor country. Uh, I, in that there are a lot of poor people uh, in PNG. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite a large country. You know, there's about, it's, its population is around 10 million and uh, it's growing rapidly. Eventually PNG will become a, a larger country than Australia. So yeah, there are a number of uh, factors that um, explain why PNG is so important for Australian aid. Um, again, it's, it's not, you can't sort of summarize uh, easily, you know, what that aid is used for. It's used for a whole range of things, you know, right through from um, building and fixing roads through to uh, vaccinating kids, uh, through to trying to improve government systems. Yeah. And um, I think with mixed success, I, anyone who knows uh, something about PNG knows it's a country that does have uh, big development challenges and uh, has a government that isn't very effective um, and that often, you know, to be frank, doesn't serve the needs of its people well. So it's a difficult environment uh, to give aid into, but it's a bit as I was saying before about the aid budget in total, it's not, aid's not gonna, aid to PNG is not gonna go away. Uh, so we have to make uh, the best and most effective use of it that we can. I think one, uh, there are success stories in uh, Australian aid to PNG. I think one is around gender. You know, there's a lot of gender inequality in PNG. Uh, you know, that's, that's still there. But I think the Australian aid budget or aid program has been successful in, in raising the profile of those issues and in uh, delivering some uh, very positive responses 
uh, to some, especially to gender-based violence. I mean, I should say that's an area I'm particularly involved in. So it's not like I'm an unbiased outside observer, but I do think uh, the Australian government's been very, had a, played a very positive role in, in sort of bringing some of these uh, issues around gender inequality to the fore and in, in promoting uh, positive responses to them. Excellent. And you have something called the PNG update. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, that's right. So we um, we work a lot. We work our, our centre works a lot on foreign aid, um, but we also work a lot on PNG in the Pacific. And of course, there's an overlap between those two because PNG in the Pacific is the most important region for Australian aid. But there's a lot more to PNG in the Pacific than aid. I mean, that obviously these are countries in their own right. They have their own economies, their own political systems. So we actually organise two conferences a year. Uh, I'll just mention first the Pacific update, which we've held this year. That was in June. That's held in Suva in Fiji uh, in partnership with the University of the South Pacific. And then uh, next month, we've got the PNG update. Uh, that's held in Port Moresby uh, with the University of Papua New Guinea. So yeah, both of these conferences we do in partnership. Uh, and they both have this sort of similar aim, which is just to um, provide a forum in which people, you know, primarily from the Pacific or from PNG. Of course, PNG is part of the Pacific. It's just it's such a big country that you know it needs its own its own conference, really. Uh, but but these two updates, uh, you know, they go back many decades. It's a long tradition. Uh, but they they their main aim is to provide a forum in which um, you know some outsiders, but mainly people from the region, uh, can uh, present their research. Uh, discuss issues of, of concern to them and, and promote uh, public discussion. Um, and, you know, one of the good things is, uh, you know, with COVID is that now everything's streamed. Um, so if, uh, same with the, the PNG update. So if people are interested in the conference, uh, of course, you're welcome. But if you can't get there in person, uh, just do go to our website, the Dev Policy website, and you'll, you'll find, you'll be able to register and, and you can find the details for streaming there. Excellent. And we've talked about sort of programs like schools and sanitation. There's also the idea of the, the Pacific migration programs. Can you give us a bit of an idea of that? Whether they work, yeah. should they be expanded? Yeah, sure. That's another real area of focus for our centre. And it's a different approach to international development. I think it's very important, you know, we don't look at international development just through a foreign aid lens. I mean, aid is one sort of tool to promote development, but it's a it's a small part of the, the resources any country or most countries have, and uh, you know countries don't get rich through aid. You know we don't, that's not uh, when when we look around the world, we look at successful countries. It's not that oh they've got a lot of aid, that's why they've developed. You know it's much more through their own efforts. Aid can help, but it's it's only one part of the puzzle. And for the Pacific, another really important part of the puzzle is labor mobility. So the Pacific countries are you know, a long way away and they're quite small. So they're not gonna follow the conventional route to development that we've seen in Asia, which is basically industrialization. You, know, you, you can build factories, you've got pretty cheap labor, um, you combine the, get the labor off the farms into the factories. Uh, you know, there's some, there are definitely issues around worker conditions, um, but over time, you are able to produce uh, industrial goods, uh, export them to the West, and uh, these workers earn more money and, and countries uh, develop. If we look at, you know, from the 50s and 60s, countries like Korea, or more recently, Indonesia, Vietnam, you know, that has been a very successful model for development. But the Pacific's not going to follow that, not going to be able to follow that model because the countries are just too far away. Some of them have uh, a good tourist destinations, um, but even that, you know, it's not enough to base an economy on. So, you know, the other, another option open to these countries is to take the people to where the jobs are. And uh, there are, are lots of jobs in Australia uh, that, that need doing. And over the last, uh, now it's sort of 15 years, uh, we've started to open up our economy much more to people from the Pacific. It started off with uh, seasonal work, with uh, recruiting workers from the Pacific to work on Australian farms. Um, but it's, it's gone beyond that. 
Uh, people now come and work from the Pacific, uh, work in aged care. A lot of people work in abattoirs. These are often jobs that uh, employers find difficult to fill. Um, and so it's, uh, it's meeting their needs as well as benefiting the people from the Pacific. Now, I know there, you know, you would have read the papers. I mean, there are definitely issues around these programs around worker protection. Uh, but, you know, I'm happy to talk about that. We've done a lot of research. Overall, these are very good schemes. They're very popular in the Pacific. Uh, they generate uh, real benefits uh, for households. And the, the advantage of the compared to aid is that the benefits, there are many advantages, actually. But one is the benefits go directly to the households. You know, these workers come to Australia, they get paid. They send their remittances back uh, to their to their families, um, and the other benefit is, of course, it's it helps us, right? It helps Australia. It doesn't cost us any money, right? In fact, it's to our economic benefit. So, it's uh, it's very different from aid uh, in that respect uh, as well. So, yeah, I think labour mobility is is an area of uh, enormous importance and uh, and a very positive story. Of, that's emerged uh, in terms of Australia Pacific relations uh, over the last 15 years. Can it ever be really expanded? And I sort of ask that because I know people are always, some people are like, oh, we don't want people coming here taking our jobs. Do you think it can ever like really be fully expanded? Uh, well, it has expanded a lot already. And, and, you know, there are now, I think it's some 30,000 Pacific Islanders in Australia in various jobs so yeah while we yeah sometimes we have that idea we don't want people to take our jobs but i mean there are lots of jobs where we have shortages we find it farmers find it difficult and, and you know the farming the seasonal farming workforce is basically a migrant workforce you know it's uh, aged care is another area anyone who's been to an aged care home will see that most of the staff there are actually migrant staff so you know we're a country of migrants and what's happened in the past, I think, is just the Pacific has missed out on that. I mean, we had, you know, let's be honest, right? We had the wide Australia policy. We sent a lot of Pacific, we expelled them, you know, at the turn of the century, right? Uh, we never welcomed Papua New Guineans into Australia, even though they were our colony. And then when the wide Australia policy ended, you know, we replaced that by a skilled migration policy. And the Pacific Islanders never had the skills to really compete uh, under that skilled policy. So, yeah, we've, we, one way or another, it's a very different story to New Zealand, you know, which has been much more welcoming of Pacific Islanders. But Australia, we've, we've kept them out. And so this is a, um, a, what we've seen in the last 15 years is a kind of historic reversal. Um, and I'll just mention one last point, actually the future, you know, you mentioned expansion. Um, you know, so far we've been talking about temporary migration. So you might come, and work on a farm, say for six months during the peak season, and go back to your home. You might come again. You know, you may, may do it maybe for five years. There's now the opportunity to actually come to Australia as a Pacific Islander for up to four years and work off the farm, say in aged care or in a, a meat processing plant. And what the government's now proposing, if it can get the legislation through, is to actually have a Pacific window into our permanent migration program. And that would build up the Pacific diaspora uh, in Australia. And, uh, you know, that would be very positive for the Pacific uh, because, um, you know, a stronger diaspora for these very small countries is uh, a really important asset, uh, especially thinking about climate change and a very uncertain future. Uh, and again, very, it'll be great for Australia because it will really make us more part of the Pacific family. So yeah, the, the labour mobility migration story for the Pacific is a really exciting one uh, at the moment. You mentioned remittance. Do we, what's the latest when it comes to remittance in the sense of, I, I used to read that this was the thing that was going to save them because it was much bigger than any foreign aid program. It's going directly to the people, they spend it in their economy. Has that borne out? It does work, it's effective. Uh, right, that's a great question. I think it's, it's effective uh, in the sense that the money goes direct to the households. Uh, unlike foreign aid, where there's a kind of much more uncertain indirect route uh, where it might go through the government or even through an NGO, uh, you know, the extent to which it actually benefits the household is, is going to vary from project to project. In this case, you know, we know the money goes direct to the household. 
so it, it makes it makes a huge difference. And we've seen remittances increase uh, dramatically as a result of these uh, labor mobility programs. Uh, yeah, I'd certainly say at the same time, you know, this is not remittances don't it, it, like aid remittances are not going to make a country rich. You know, you're not going to see countries actually become high income prosperous like Australia on the back of remittances. So it's not a silver bullet uh, to to development. Um, but, you know, overall, it's it's extremely positive. What one thing we've learned is that uh, migrants keep sending remittances, especially from the Pacific. It's not like they forget about where they're from. They retain those very strong links with the Pacific. Uh, so remittances have increased over time uh, rather than than fallen. And um, yeah, while, while remittances are not a silver bullet, I think we've certainly seen that for the Pacific, those countries with larger remittances uh, do much better than those with uh, less remittances. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, you know, you, you need to look at, uh, you need to respect people's choices. And when you go to the Pacific and you see the queues of people lining up to get a job in Australia, I think that tells you all you need to know. Now, I'm going to put both of you on the spot and get you to ask each other a question. We'll start with you, Meg, but I'll give you some time to think of a question for Stephen. I'll ask Stephen one more question. Um, Stephen, I've heard in international development, there's this debate about whether we should shift to cash direct cash transfers as opposed to programs. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, that's right. That's a bit like along the lines I was thinking, along the lines I was talking about, like make, it's, it's sort of making aid more like remittances. Um, you know, just give, rather than having complicated projects, uh, just give the cash to the people and, you know, they're in the best position to decide uh, what to do with it. In terms of what I think about it, uh, I think it's, it's definitely a good thing for governments to do. Um, you know, Australia does it, right? We, we do it. You know, if, if you're unemployed, you can go to a, a government office and, and sign up for a benefit. Uh, if, if you're, you know, above a certain age, right, you, and your income's below a certain level or your assets are below a certain level, you can sign up for a benefit. So Australia does it. Of course, poor countries can't afford to do it at the same level as Australia because they just don't have the resources. Um, but, you know, they... At the same time, they can't just wait. I don't think, it, you know, while I, I, I strongly believe that economic growth, right, is the long-term answer to poverty, but you can't just ask poor people, well, just wait for economic growth and eventually, you know, you'll get a job and everything will be fine. You know, these are people who are hungry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're really living an unacceptable life. So yeah, even developing countries have also shown that they can implement uh, cash transfers uh, in an effective way. So, yeah, I think it's definitely something governments should do. Uh, you know, then you come to donors. Uh, should donors do it? I think, uh, you know, we've certainly seen in disasters. Uh, when disasters strike, it's often the most effective thing to do is just to give someone cash, you know, because they, rather than giving them food, right, or clothes, you know, because the person, the household is in the best position to decide what they need. And uh, the market will respond. You know, once they have cash, people with food, with clothes will come to the market and uh, they'll be able to uh, decide. So definitely for disasters, I think cash has proven itself. Um, otherwise, it's, it's one thing donors can do. I don't think it's the only thing uh, they can do because, of course, it's not the only thing governments do, right? Governments don't just hand out cash. They also, they have to build infrastructure, right? They have to get kids through school. So... It's kind of, I'd see it more as an option, a good option for uh, NGOs and donor agencies to consider, you know, rather than it's the only thing you know, that they should do. Excellent. Now, Meg has a really good question for you. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, oh, thank you so much for what you've been um, speaking into, Stephen. It's, it's been so, um, so lovely to be able to hear someone um, speak into those areas with, um, with tact and wisdom. So thank you for presenting this sector well. Um, I think my question for you would be, um, with all of your experience and all of your understanding, what would you hope to see from, what would, what would your advice be to someone? I imagine one of the listeners would be, okay, well, how do I engage with this well? What does it look like to be, you know, to donate or what does it look like to participate? 
what would your advice be to someone uh, listening to this on how to engage with aid and development well? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, yeah, I'd say, first of all, like, if you can, like, think about donating yourself. You know, even if it's a small amount of money, find one of these many good NGOs that are out there and think about donating. You know, I, I, I do worry, like, as we moved away, fewer Australians go to church um, or, or participate more generally in uh, religious activity. Uh, we kind of lost some of that culture of uh, donations. And if you look at donations from uh, the public to NGOs, you know, while they're like, it's a billion dollars, it sounds impressive, but it's pretty flat. You know, it's not, it's not growing. So I think that culture of donating and, and just as a response to the fact that, you know, we are the lucky country, right? We, we are, you know, just, you're lucky to be born in a country like Australia. So I think donating is a good idea. I think, uh, you know, writing to the government, uh, asking the government to give more aid. I think that's another good idea. I think the government does have this sense that the Australian public is not really that concerned about aid. And so they don't need to increase foreign aid. Um, so I think countering that message is, uh, is really important. And then uh, beyond that, you know, if you're interested, uh, there, you know, there are lots of NGOs out there, uh, big and small, and there are ways to get involved as uh, volunteers uh, in a voluntary capacity, uh, whether it's uh, through fundraising or through, um, you know, more technical work. Uh, you know, you can go and study in international development and think about having a career uh, in it. I think that's, you know, so there's, I guess there's a whole uh, spectrum of things that uh, people can do uh, who, who have a, an interest or, or a passion in this area. And to give Stephen a chance to think of a question for you, Meg, can I ask you a question uh, first, Meg? How do you, and you've touched on this a little bit before, how do you stay optimistic? Because, you know, you look at what's going on in the world and you would get first-hand stories about the struggles. How do you stay optimistic that we're going to get somewhere, that we're going to be able to really help? Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. And thank you, Stephen, for your answer before. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, I actually was kind of hoping this would come up. Uh, I think it's something really important for people that want to be involved long term to start thinking about. And I wish someone came to me when I started in this work and gave me some advice. Um, and it was, I've learned over the years to, as an aid worker, you need to create your own tool belt. You don't, um, there's no one, re you're really a contractor, even if you're working for an NGO for 10 years. You, you've kind of got to think of yourself as an individual and that looks like a tool belt with, you know, contributing to your own superannuation because maybe you'll work as a volunteer or a contractor for a, a couple of years on a project and, and you won't actually have, you're not taking care of your, your retirement years. So making sure you're, you're sustainable long-term, really, really making sure that you've got support systems, so regular counselling, regular supervision, have a mentor, talk to other development professionals. Um, and then also I think thinking about why it is that you're doing it for myself. Um, sometimes in, in some of the most challenging moments that I've ever worked in, I've known what motivates me and trying to trigger that. Okay, while I'm about to go and run down to uh, an office in a, in a refugee camp to demand more UN tents because we just got a big boat full of refugees on the shoreline, I've got a million things to do. This is like screaming, screaming, screaming. But am I going to slow down enough on the walk there to listen into the tent next to me and hear a child singing into, into a fan? You know that sound that goes, ah, and we've all done it as children. And am I actually going to acknowledge the humanity in this moment, Get bring hope from that? Oh, that people are living. Even in the most insane chaos, life continues. There's hope. There's goodness in the small, small things. Noticing a tomato plant someone planted in front of their tent entrance because, you know, one fresh tomato in how long it's going to take to grow that. Um, but just those little, little snippets of hope and not thinking that they don't matter and always looking for the grand scheme change. You've really got to grab hold of those small, hopeful moments and enjoy them because it's the small wins sometimes that keep you um, sensed it and why you're doing it um, but everyone has a different motivation for why they're 
why they're engaging with the work. So I think it's important to tap into why why you're there and what got you there. And maybe that has to change. Like I think people get, anyway, I won't talk too much, but people get involved in aid work from maybe a, a, an interesting um, uh, perspective at the start and maybe that in a healthy way gets challenged and changes. So also going, okay, yeah, having some self-development in that as well. So. Thank you so, so yeah, much for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. And I remember I heard a talk from Doctors Without Borders, and they were saying that one of the big issues for returned aid workers is they find it hard to put up with Western issues. You know, like they'll come back from a from a, a country where they saw a lot of things, and then there'll be people here going, "Oh, somebody's you know um, pushed a trolley into my Mercedes." And they find it hard to kind of put up with the kind of the first world problems when they've experienced those really um, tough problems where people don't have water and there's violence and, and things like that. So that was sort of their experience. Yeah, I mean, I think even to challenge that, I think suffering's relative and I think it's tempting to come back and compare, but it's just not the same context. You know, for the lady on the bus the other morning who was losing it because the bus was late, she missed her train, that's her That's her nine out of ten of frustration mm -hmm. because maybe she had a physio appointment she needs to get to, maybe she doesn't have a car, she can't afford it in Sydney. You know, so I think it's important not to compare it because it's not the same context. You know, it's it's people suffering is real to them, whether, whether we think it's a necessary reaction, maybe not, but... Um, but really caring for the individual no matter where they are, no matter where they're at, because that's that's really a good compassion and empathy um, practice because otherwise, yeah, it's going to be an, an unjust comparison coming home and you're just going to get frustrated and it's not going to help. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, now, Stephen has a very tough, controversial question for you. <laughs> right. Oh, Meg, good. I enjoyed uh, listening to your account installation. I mean, you talked a lot of, about your part about partnership. So I just, I, I just have two questions. <laughs> One specific. So are your partners like this local Salvation Army agencies? Is that are they your partners, or do you have other partners? And then the sort of more general question is, I'm sure you know you know this term localization. And uh, to that, to explain to David, I mean that is kind of that's one of the big, I guess, pushes at the moment is to really uh, prioritize local efforts for development, that development has to come from within and the role of the uh, Australian NGO or Australian government is to support those local efforts. So um, given that you're already working, uh, Meg, with local partners, what I'd just be you know, interested to hear your reflections on, on localization and, and how you see it. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Stephen. Um... Yeah, it is a huge focus of what we do um, instead, and it's it's definitely a posture that we want to have. Um, so, so to answer your first question, yes, we we work with our our partners that are. So really, the the context looks different depending on which country, which area. But we've got Salvation Army territories, and they might be a church, they might be more than that. They're, they're doing their own activities, and and so we're partnering with um, our Salvation Army. Um, church or, or corps, our offices on the ground, and, and they're not always developing professionals, very rarely. Um, they, they're, they're community workers, they're, they're pastors, they're, um, they're, they're doing whatever activities um, that, that office has, has going. Um, and sometimes they, the staff that they hire are development professionals, so a project uh, goes uh, into the implementation stage staff um, are hired and they're seeking out those development professionals from in country. Um, so it, it is and it isn't, it, it really depends. Um, in that we are we are very supportive, we are offering as much as, as, they'll, as they'll be willing to take and it's always a partnership. So how can we provide training? You know, we've got, you know, a four month training uh, on, on monitoring, evaluation and learning, uh, or there's one on project development. Uh, and, and we'll, we'll lead you through these projects with all of the all of the steps. You know, what is what is a log frame? What is a theory of change? Uh, you know, are we meeting our indicators? And it's always very hand in hand because hey, maybe this uh, Salvation Army soldier will go and get a job in, with another NGO, or maybe this office can seek funding 
from another source and how great would it be that we've equipped them with the skills um, to, and, and the methods to do that. So that's something that excites me. It's not, we're not training them in our processes. These are just general uh, development processes. Um, and, and yes, it's, it's asset-based community development, right? They, this, they have so much to give. They have so much, um, so many resources, whether that's physical, but also social. Um, and I think it's important to, where possible in this context, we get to we get to say it's localized. It's again, if it's a disaster relief setting, it's very different. The need and the response can't always be that way. Like it has to be brought in. People are brought in for a month at a time. These sorts of things. So the joy of of these long term projects is that we get to take this approach um, and we get to make sure where possible it's it's locally led. So I love receiving when we do have photo reports, we have so many safeguards in place regarding all of this, um, but when we do have those uh, those photos come through of beneficiaries with their permission, uh, it's so, so lovely to see, um, yeah, a community member sitting on the chair under a mango tree talking to a girl about, about her experience of, of, of early child marriage and, and what the project's done to, to combat that in her life. And, and it's just, yeah, it's lovely to, to not always see an, an expat in the photo. <laughs> Um, not that not that we don't have a place, but I think it's yeah, I think it's an important thing to to empower people. Excellent, thank you so much, Meg and Stephen, for for joining us to talk about something that's very important. Well, thanks a lot, David. Thanks for your interest and and some great questions. It was a good discussion.